grandfather is back. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. In this review, we'll be taking a look at Gran Turismo 7 from a sim racer's perspective, as well as that of a casual gamer and car fan. It's a game that aims to be a great many things to a great many people, and it's worth looking at from a few different angles. The Gran Turismo series is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, and this is something that Gran Turismo 7 will not let you forget. Less of a game and more of a celebration of car culture in its various forms, Gran Turismo 7 is centered around a career progression mode that aims to educate as much as it entertains. Classic aspects of Gran Turismo are back, allowing us to once again buy the cheapest available 90s Japanese crap box and turn it into an 800 brake horsepower fire breathing crap box of destruction which can barely manage its power on track until we eventually realize we have enough money to just buy a Porsche outright and actually just enjoy a normal driving experience while still winning races. Of course, there are certain things that we'll flesh out in even more detail in future dedicated videos, such as how the physics compare to the high-end simulators, as well as how the wheel experience compares to the controller. So consider hitting that subscribe button to get notified of those, or don't. Who am I to tell you what to do? Let's just appreciate that one of the foundational car games of our generation is finally back with another title. So let's delve in and see what awaits. Assuming you've grabbed the Sony Store version, after downloading approximately 10 gigabytes, the game will graciously allow you to play through three stages of the new Music Rally mode. While a bit of a gimmick, it's actually a great way to quickly acquaint yourself with the driving in Gran Turismo 7. After going through a few prompts to set the type of driving, assists, and AI difficulty you want, you're thrown into the stage. You get to advance through three different types of classic road car, incrementing in their power to get you acquainted, all the while literally racing against the music. After the game installs, you're treated with the great big opening cinematic, vibing you up for the celebration of car history to come, and dropped into the world map. The career mode is based around a central progression hub, the cafe. The cafe's owner has a thing for cars and will guide you through various phases as you're tasked with collecting three cars at a time based around a given manufacturer or product line theme. This is essentially what creates the main set of missions to advance the game. Not to be confused with the actual missions minigame introduced in GT7. Collecting these cars is done by winning selected race events, which also unlock elements of the game such as new racetracks and modes. It's only after completing menu book number 9 that you're even able to play multiplayer, whether that be open lobbies or just local split screen with your friends. The career will span all across the United States, Asia and Oceania, and Europe, with you unlocking legendary fictional tracks such as Trial Mountain and Deep Forest Raceway, as well as their real-life counterparts such as Daytona International, Monza, Spa, the Nürburgring, etc. Speaking of unlocks, GT7 brings the long-awaited return of Gran Turismo's infamous license tests. You'll need certain tiers of license to take part in different events. Generally speaking, the more prestigious the event, the higher the license required. The license test should need no introduction to anyone that's played a classic Gran Turismo game. One of our unspoken agreements in years past was that we would all grind as hard as possible in our free time until we eventually unlocked gold across all license tests, as difficult as that was. The good news is that the license tests are a lot easier in GT7. Getting bronze is a virtual no-brainer, so you'll be able to unlock the licenses you need to take part in race events without much trouble. Getting gold is a slightly different story. While a bit of a challenge in controller, most of the license tests are reasonably straightforward to blitz gold for any semi-experienced sim racer, since perhaps one or two events that are set up specifically to infuriate you. The benefit from earning gold here is that the game gifts you with bonus cars, to make your journey through the career mode just that little bit easier. While your career will begin in a modest, front-wheel drive hatchback, you'll soon be packing a hyper-tuned 90s crap box to blitz your way through. For me, this was a chance to relive my original playthrough of Gran Turismo back in 1998. I bought a modest little Mitsubishi GTO Twin Turbo and tuned it to be an absolute beast. Luckily, one can do the exact same thing here, a quarter century later, in glorious ray trace detail. I 
After you outgrow the Fast and Furious nostalgia, you can move on from the used car dealership to Brand Central, which is essentially the new car hub for all manufacturers. Everything from Ford to Pagani is on offer, with the balance of your bank account being the only limiting factor, sans a few vehicles one must be invited to purchase. You'll go from highly tuned road cars and supercars through to driving proper race prep GT cars in various categories from GR4 all the way through to 1, including hypercars and a lot of experimental units too. What's remarkable in this title is the sheer sense of handling difference you get between a highly tuned R32 Skyline putting out several hundred brake horsepower and a meagre GR4 Porsche Cayman putting out a third of the power but on many circuits still taking the win due to bespoke race components leading to far better cornering grip and braking performance. See, GT7 isn't a purist nor a snob. You'll often find yourself pitting your GT4 car against road cars or vice versa. Events have a suggested PP level which, other than sounding hilarious, is how the power of vehicles is defined in GT7. The more PP, the more powerful. Huh. Not all events are subject to this lack of requirements, however. Some have a hard ceiling, and you simply cannot exceed it no matter the car you use. This is where elements such as engine detunes, power restrictors, and ballast come into it. Other events limit you to the specific type of car or manufacturer that can enter them. This all creates a sense of impetus to expand your car collection rather than putting all your eggs into one basket and turning your GTO Twin Turbo into something that can race a Le Mans hypercar. It's a fun progression mechanic and in place to encourage experimentation and growth rather than playing at being realistic in any sense. Speaking of which, most career races are based around the formula of starting you at or near the end of the field, with no qualifying session, then giving you a select number of laps to overtake everyone on your way to the win. While a time-tested mechanic to keep casuals engaged, it's not going to do much for those who want to be raced hard by the AI. In fact, the lack of PP requirements <laughs> will often lead to races where your overtuned monstrosity absolutely devours everything around it, leading to you simply lapping by yourself until the race is done. Each new car you win or buy is a markedly special experience, with them all possessing very unique handling characteristics. Even for a thoroughbred sim racer who is perfectly entertained by pure racing with no structure around it, the career mode still manages to somehow be compelling. You always want to unlock that next batch of cars, or blitz that next license test, or get first in every single race of that championship with the power restriction with a guy in the souped up VW Beetle is somehow destroying everyone. Given that I was captivated enough while playing to just want to continue doing so for hours, instead of playing for the sake of capturing content, as we creators often do, is a testament to how well curated and set up GT7's career mode actually is. Seemingly always the talk of the town with the Gran Turismo title, it never fails to impress how much polyphony you're able to get out of the limited console hardware when it comes to presenting a truly impressive car experience. The big addition to GT7 is ray tracing, and while it can only be enabled on external replays and not in real-time racing, even at the cost of cutting the FPS down to Omega 30, it does create for some astonishing photos and scapes. While our hardware may not be quite here to run it in real time in this generation, it will almost certainly be available for the next, and will likely change the presentation of games forever. Lighting balance is something that Gran Turismo has always nailed, and this simply takes it to the next level. Most regular sim racing titles struggle a lot with washed out and flat lighting, especially during the noon hours, but GT7 suffers from no such issue. The colour balance, as well as the post-processing, is always on point and makes the racing experience truly effervescent. While the sheer detail of the car models may not compare to a Seto Corsa running at full with CSP, Soul and Reshade, Gran Turismo makes the most of everything at its disposal to simply create impressive looking scenes in most situations. What's impressive for a title that most gamers will be playing from hood or chase cam is that there is a very detailed interior cam. While the motion of the interior can make it a little disconcerting for proper tight racing, it's very impressive that they went above and beyond to render the interiors of the cars to these levels all the same. The track detail is phenomenal, with the standard array of fictional tracks being complemented with laser scan recreations of famous real circuits. 
While the sheer polygonal detail may not exactly match up to a title such as Assetto Corsa Competizione, and perhaps occasionally have some strange renderings of curbs as well as other bits, the way that the tracks are textured and stylized gives them a presentation that looks like the benchmark for racing games, especially my beloved Nürburgring. Racing the Nordschleife in GT7 is less game and more of an experience. The awesome lighting balance, changing times of day and dynamic weather create for some dramatic scenes. All in all, it's safe to say the Gran Turismo 7 is one off, if not the best looking racing games in existence. Of course, under certain specific circumstances, highly modded titles like Assetto Corsa can give it a run for its money, especially when it comes to modeling car detail and interiors. But given the hardware that GT7 runs on, it looks tremendous. Unfortunately, the rumors about 120Hz gameplay didn't eventuate, and GT7 can only run at 4K 60Hz during races on the PS5. While a far cry beneath what we're doing with PC sim racing, once the eyes get used to it, a consistent 60Hz is perfectly serviceable. As a career sound engineer, I might spend a little longer touching on this than the average reviewer. Traditionally, the Gran Turismo series was never known for phenomenal sound. The first iterations of the game in fact just use really annoying, repetitive synthesis in order to recreate the sound of cars. This all changed in 2015 when Dirt Rally took racing game sound to a whole new level, setting the benchmark for all to follow. Being developed on by its sequel, then rivaled by Race Room and Assetto Corsa Competizione, these rounded out the best sounding racing titles around. ACC in particular brought all manner of mechanical whirs, whines, chassis creaks, underbody rattling and whatnot to the experience. While GT7 doesn't quite match up to the level of sonic detail of a title such as ACC or even Race Room, it does set a new benchmark for the Gran Turismo series. The cars all legitimately have their own tonal signatures, sounding like they've been legitimately captured by mics, then manipulated by post-processing, rather than synthesized from the ground up. The sound of an R32's RB26 inline six-cylinder engine is a completely different tonal signature to a GT4 Porsche Cayman's boxer engine. This all helps add to the uniqueness of each car, making the experience of acquiring it all that much more special. This is added to by the sound actually changing and becoming more aggressive when a larger race exhaust is fitted to the car. Not to mention the addition of induction and blow-off sounds when turbocharging a naturally aspirated vehicle. If there are any drawbacks to note here, I would say that the collection of miscellaneous sounds found within the cockpit and Assetto Corsa Competizione are a lot more engaging. It's not just about the diff whine, the engine roar and the transmission clunks, but also the sound of the underbody impacts, the chassis groans and all those little things that complete the experience. GT7's representation is a little more basic. The addition of reverb to external shots also often feels quite overdone and synthetic sounding. It could do with some dialing back, or the reverb processing being tweaked for more realistic reflection bounces off the environment. Music is a different story. Gran Turismo has always been the racing game benchmark for awesome soundtrack, whether it be cool jazz, electro, or industrial metal. GT7 takes us to a whole new level, incorporating a ton of music from prior releases for a total of around 150 different songs. The big thing that all of us CarPG nerds really care about. The tuning in GT7 is back with a bang. The tuning shop categorizes all the parts into five distinct tiers. Sports, club sports, semi-racing, racing, and extreme. While these might be a good way to create a progression mechanic and explain the parts to casuals, it does create a confusing situation for more seasoned sim racers, wondering why overlapping car parts are available across multiple tiers. Parts are often doubled up across the category tiers, with no indication that one would actually be an upgraded version of the other, no doubt causing many gamers to waste money buying the same parts again by accident. 
There is a standard array of tyre choices from comfort through to sport through to racing, corresponding with road tyres, semi-slicks and slicks, with the addition of intermediate and wet tyres for adverse weather racing. Upgrading to slicks from comfort tyres can be one of the most impactful tunes to make on any car, as reflected by a drastic increase in its PP level. <laughs> The standard array of turbochargers and superchargers for all spectrums of the rev range are available, as well as the ECUs and tunable suspension, brake balance controllers, LSDs, etc. Some of these offer additional race tuning options, such as a fully customizable race suspension, allowing for tuning not only the springs and the dampers, but also the wheel camber, tow, and sway bars. This allows a veteran racer to tune the balance of the car specifically to their liking. The more visual end of this is handled in the shop called GT Auto. Here you can do all the old car PG things like washing your car, changing its oil, refreshing its chassis and engine, and the really cool part, add a wide body modification. Possibly one of the coolest things we all want to do on our road cars. Also in GT Auto, you have the ability to apply a dazzling spectrum of body and wheel paint finishes far more than a single person would ever really be able to get through, many of them based on legitimate finishes offered by manufacturers in the real world. You also have the ability to add a roll cage, as well as various bits of aero trim to the car. Notably, the addition of a rear spoiler and front lip will allow you to tune the front and rear downforce levels of the car before races. This is critical in getting its high speed balance and handling correct. This tuning and performance part overlap between the tuning shop and GT Auto isn't great, it will have veteran racers asking themselves which of these parts is purely for aesthetics and which actually affect the performance. For instance, does the addition of a roll cage increase body rigidity and weight? If so, then why isn't it in the tuning shop? And if no, then what's the point? Also, how does this, if at all, relate to the increased body rigidity feature in the tuning shop? Ultimately, it would be good to have a better indication of whether the aesthetic parts in GT Auto actually provide a tangible change to the car's handling, and how this affects the resulting PP level. <laughs> Last but not least, the amount of wheel rims on offer is quite impressive. Combined with the array of finishes that can be splashed over them, will keep car tuners happy until the cows come home. The big boy chapter for all the sim races. This is really what you're hoping to find out, isn't it? Just how realistic the driving is in GT7. Is it worth your time? Is it just an arcade game in disguise? Well, pull up a chair and take a seat around the fireplace, we're going to delve deep into this one. From controller to wheel, from haptic feedback to force feedback, and from tire flex to bicep flex. Let's do it. While looking for a set of PS5 compatible pedals, I spent my initial two dozen hours on GT7 using the controller exclusively. The haptic feedback around the buttons is a great way to tell when you're overdoing the acceleration or braking. Each will rumble when TC or ABS respectively get engaged. It allows you to feel the limit of the car in a way unlike any prior generation of racing titles. That said, it's one tricky title to play on a controller. Sure, you can get 90% of the way there with a bit of finesse, but pulling out the final second or two per lap can truly be a gargantuan feat. To its credit, GT7 is a sucker for weight transfer. It has to be gentle and purposeful. If you simply throw the left stick around everywhere, expecting to stick it through the corners, you're going to have a very bad time. The initial experience led me to think that there was more than met the eye under the hood of Gran Turismo, that potentially there was a bona fide simulator waiting underneath. After what felt like an eon, finally hooking it up to my racing rig, though with far diminished pedals to my regular set to ensure PS5 compatibility, I jumped into my first race, the Toyota Supra GR4 at Brands Hatch. I did this on purpose, because I've driven this track for thousands of laps on Assetto Corsa Competizione in race cars and know it implicitly. I wanted to feel what it would be to simply jump in and use my pre-established muscle memory on the circuit. I was pleasantly surprised. The default force feedback settings from the official Fanatec GTDD Pro just married immediately to Gran Turismo 7. I began to drive like it was the most natural thing on earth. Within two laps, I was already beating my best controller times by seconds. So in short, we can use this section to say that yes, using a wheel for this game is not only more engaging, but it's very likely to also give you more consistent and better performance over time.
This is usually a dead giveaway that there's a more advanced physics engine under the hood, requiring the finer motor control offered by wheel and pedals. What I can say is that Gran Turismo drives much like a modern sim, though a touch simplified. Of all the sims I've driven, it felt closest to Race Room with its new force feedback engine, though more rudimentary. It doesn't have the emergent qualities or liveliness of Automobilista 2 or R Factor 2's force feedback. It also lacks the finer detail of ACC's force feedback. Much like Race Room, the self aligning torque forces and high speed damping are on point. Those medium and larger forces are well represented and never have you feeling like you weren't given enough to drive the car. The lack of detail often comes in the finer forces. There's very little road feel and the curves can be very hit or miss. Sometimes you can mount a very irregular surface and not feel anything at all through the wheel. It's not the best force feedback engine in the world, but it's certainly not the worst either. Out of the box with absolutely no adjustment, it's perfectly drivable and for most people that will be more than enough. Now, what about the car handling itself? Well, the basic archetypes are rendered remarkably well. Driving an FF hatchback? Prepare for the accelerators to give you a wash of understeer dragging you off the track. Conversely, driving a rear engine Porsche? Prepare to lift off the throttle and have the car basically turn itself through the corner. Midships act as you would expect, FRs act as you would expect, and so does everything else. In fact, I even prefer driving it to some simulators from several years ago as Gran Turismo tends to have more consistent handling from car to car and more predictable curb behaviours, allowing you to approximate the real-life lines more closely. A cursory look at external replays will show you that tyre flex is modelled visually, and based on what I've experienced while driving, I believe in some rudimentary manner it's also modelled in the physics engine itself. While it's a far cry from the physically modelled tyre feel from iRacing, it does hearken at the feel of race room to some degree, what I would call a well-dialed empirical model. While there is a tyre temperature model, there does not appear to be a tyre pressure one, or at the very least those pressures are not adjustable, you're simply always in the optimum range. I've experienced variable braking and traction performance while driving, which would suggest that tyre heat does play a part in GT7, possibly even insofar as track or atmospheric conditions are concerned. Tyre wear goes without saying. The more you wear down the tyres, the worse your grip becomes. There is an element of tyre strategy in the longer endurance races, and this is always welcome. While it isn't mind-blowing, there's a fairly solid aerodynamic model in the Title II. I've driven everything from hot hatches through to super formula cars, and the difference is very notable. You can feel the difference in performance yourself if you simply drive a stock version of your favourite sports car across a track you're familiar with, then promptly go and bolt a splitter and wing to the same car and come back. You'll immediately be more glued to the ground. GT7, a set of soft slicks and a bit of aero are some of the easiest and most effective initial upgrades you can make to a car, and that's very telling, because it basically mirrors real life. The slipstream in GT7 is a bit tuned down compared to GT Sport, and behaves somewhat more realistically. Real life slipstreams don't tend to be a nitro boost, but rather just an additional edge to give you a chance in the final straight, assuming you got a good run out compared to your opponent. GT7 mirrors this far more closely, with the slipstream model closest to that of iRacing or Assetto Corsa Competizione. I'd be remiss if I didn't quickly touch on the gravel physics. If you've ever driven a dirt rally title, you'll feel well at home here, and even more so if you've ever done a rally on Beam and G Drive. Gran Turismo's take on the experience will feel like a mega simplified, back to basics version of rally driving. Same principles apply. Use the wheel and pedals to shift the car's weight around as needed, throw the car's rear into the turn, and then blast the throttle in order to get around. All good and well until you arrive at a jump. I'm unsure what Polyphony were thinking, but if this is how airborne rally cars behaved in real life, any Finnish rally stage would have to be scheduled around days of funerals. G7 
GT7 straddles the line between accessibility and physics depth. In a way, it's quite remarkable that the game is playable on a controller at all, given the depth of physics under the hood. While it's certainly no iRacing or Assetto Corsa Competizione, and if you're buying it as a stand-in for such, you're going to be sorely disappointed, but augmented with the engaging career mode, progression mechanic, tuning, and wealth of different types of racing on offer, assuming those are factors to your enjoyment, Gran Turismo 7 can most certainly be more than meets the eye when sitting in a sim rig. Obviously, the biggest drawback to the title currently is its exclusivity to PS5 and the limited sim racing hardware that implies. Most of us have to downgrade our hardware substantially in order to drive it, and there's something to be said about the frustration inherent to that. With any luck, the exclusivity will lapse as it has with many of Sony's titles, and we'll be able to enjoy GT7 with the compatibility and processing power of our PCs in time. All in all, I would say that I've been quite pleasantly surprised with the predictability of GT7's handling. It ties in more closely to the thoroughbred sims than I expected, and the driving experiences and lap times across familiar circuits would attest to that. The big addition to GT7 is variable weather. This was thoroughly demoed in the state of play leading up to release, so we'll only touch on it briefly enough to talk about the tangible impact it has on gameplay. From what I can tell, the system is what they say it is. There are dynamic drying lines on wet tracks, with puddles concentrating on certain sections. This forces you to drive more carefully in adverse weather and really pick where you plan to position your car. This all ties into the rubber that your car is packing. If you're in a set of racing or sports tyres, your only hope is to chase the dry patches of track left. On inters or wets, you get a lot more flexibility as the tyres are able to diffuse the water without aquaplaning constantly. One of the championship races is a great showcase of this beginning you on a wet Red Bull ring which only gets more wet toward the middle of the race and then suddenly begins to dry on the last two laps. Your lap times all naturally reflect this, as do the breakpoints you use, and it's a great test case for inters. I've made the mistake in the past of packing racing tyres on a wet track, and it was not a good time. You definitely have to bear tyre strategy in mind, which is a great addition to a game as accessible as GT7. The weather system is something I've not had as much experience with as I would like, as the career mode appears to shy away from adverse weather in the early to mid portion. I'm very keen to delve into the more intense endurance races and see how factors such as tyre strategy and weather interact when you're racing for a few hours at a time. Definitely stay tuned to the channel for my developing views on this. For most gamers, the AI is where the racing experience starts and ends. Many will never hit multiplayer and will instead just enjoy the career experience, a few minigames, and call it a day. To that end, the AI quality is critical to the experience of Gran Turismo 7. Despite teasing the emergent machine learning AI, Sophie, it's not yet ready for full implementation into a Gran Turismo title, so what we're left with for now is regular old hard-coded AI. The AI, for the most part, is serviceable, but not fantastic. This is compounded by the fact that races are often set up in the casual manner of start last and quickly work your way to first across very few laps. While this can be exciting for casuals, it's not particularly realistic and forces you to overtake a lot, meaning that there's likely to be a lot of contact. In a way, the game encourages you to push and belt past your opponents in order to maintain the momentum to get all the overtakes you need in the short time that you have. Rarely are you afforded the ability to show patience and plan your overtakes in the final straight. On narrow tracks like the Nürburgring, the AI can be very hazardous, as they don't tend to be aware of the player's presence when approaching from behind, and often won't leave space or will simply just cut across the line of a faster car. This is compounded by the fact that you'll often simply just bounce off AI cars and fly off the track while they continue on their merry way, seemingly unaffected by the contact. On the whole, I would say that the AI is raceable, but it won't be blowing your mind, or giving you the nail-biting close racing you may be looking for. They exist solely as placeholders to fill a track as the player completes their objective of rushing toward first place. The multiplayer aspect of Gran Turismo very much deserves its own video to fully explore. 
However, since this is a sim racer's take, it would be silly not to at least touch on the multiplayer features offered since this is what will constitute the vast majority of playtime for the more serious racers. Gran Turismo 7 offers three different multiplayer modes. Local split screen, sport, and if you want to take your life into your hands, public lobbies. These three modes essentially increase with the player's commitment. Local split screen is a great way to have fun with your friends, while public lobbies are a great way to dip your toes into the online multiplayer where there are very few stakes. Sport is for the serious crew. It consists of three daily races which are on rotation. These require you to provide a car spec and tune to a specific set of criteria. You get a little bit of leeway here, so the lineups still tend to be fairly diverse, with people providing anything from heavily tuned 90 streetcars through to modern supercars to bespoke racing cars and just about anything else that's allowed. Sport mode has a personal sportsmanship rating for the player, meaning that you're encouraged to leave space for the cars around you rather than playing bumper cars. The goal is to win as many races, or at least race as many clean, well-performed races as you can to advance in your racer class. This is definitely the end game mode for dedicated Gran Turismo players. Currently, there is some hubbub in the community about whether tuning has its place on these online races as it can create a massive performance gap between vehicles. There are bugs involved and others want the BOP system back, etc. So what we'll do is wait for Polyphony to step in and for the situation in sport mode to resolve itself before we dive too deeply into it. We'll explore these modes in more depth in a dedicated multiplayer review in the future, so stay tuned. Well, that certainly was a bit of a journey. After so many years away, turns out there was quite a lot to talk about with Gran Turismo 7. Given that this review came out a few weeks casually late, one benefit is that I was afforded some serious time to get into the nuts and bolts of it and feel out the game. It of course had nothing to do with me not being able to get the review key I planned for, nor the capture hardware I bought specifically for the PS5 being DOA, or the fact that my pedals weren't compatible with the PS5 and I had to frantically search for hardware to shoot this. Oh no, this was all part of my grand plan to give you a thorough and well-equilibrated review. Yep, I'm sticking with that story. If you're a hardcore sim racer with triple screens or VR who lives for competitive online play in iRacing or leagues in Assetto Corsa Competizione, is this the right game for you? Hell no. If you're more of a moderate who genuinely enjoys cars and can appreciate the experience of starting low and working your way up through increasing tiers of vehicles and races while chilling out and enjoying some more casually paced events intended to entertain rather than stimulate and challenge your absolute knowledge of the limits of driving, then it could very well be the game for you. If you don't know the slightest thing about cars but kept seeing all the hype about this game and thought you'd give it a shot anyway, then it could very well still be the game for you. Gran Turismo more than perhaps any other series, goes out of its way to acquaint new players with the basics of driving via its license system, and slow-paced races which eventually work their way up into high-flying global events. One thing it never manages to be, however, is boring. There is always a new car a new objective, or something else to keep you compelled and engaged. And as they say, there's no better time to start than the present. Gran Turismo 7 is like the master jack of all trades. It has a bit of something for everybody, even many sim racers in my opinion. The car PG mechanic is great for nerds like myself who've loved role-playing games their entire lives, while the surprisingly well-developed driving model also speaks to my inner sim racer. Above all, it loves to celebrate cars. There is more here than just a few recurring races. There are museums, there are historical footnotes, there's a whole encyclopedic underbelly to the game which is begging to educate you about the rich history of motorsport. It's so compelling that even while I was stuck on the controller waiting to record this content, I felt a strange compulsion to just keep playing for the sheer enjoyment, even without capturing usable footage. That's about the best compliments a content creator can give to a game. I look forward to developing more on certain parts of this review, in particular the wheel versus the controller experience, as well as the overall multiplayer experience, with a focus on sport mode. 
Be sure to subscribe to get notified of those upcoming features in the near future. And if you feel like diving in and getting the most out of your Gran Turismo 7 experience, feel free to take the Fanatec affiliate links in the description down below which support the channel and link to the exact gear I use to capture all this footage with. So until next time.